I've always said I've learned more useful business stuff at the age of six than I have at, at any stage since. In fact, I'm convinced I've learned more useful business stuff at the age of six than I did at any point since. Let me tell you what I mean. Um, I grew up in the west of Ireland in the 70s. My dad had a beef farm, which I guess meant he grew beef. He had lots of cows, and once a cow had a calf, two or four weeks later, he would buy in some extra calves and match them up with what we used to call a surrogate cow. This usually meant that each cow could rear two, sometimes even three calves at a time. And once the calves had grown up, my dad would sell them on at the age of two. And these cows were the first step for the revenue stream on the farm. Selling the, the grown up calves was what sustained the family and what paid the bills. This was the business model, basically. They kept the family going. There were six of us, uh, my mom and my dad and two boys and two girls. I was the eldest. I suppose you could say it was quite a modest setup. And as you can imagine, there's a, you know, a lot of working capital tied up in a calf herd until they grow up and then you sell them on two years later. But it worked quite well, so long as you kept the cycle moving. I really enjoyed my childhood on the farm. Yeah, I was on my own for the first six years and my siblings all arrived after that. And I enjoyed very much the, the, uh, the long, hot summers. And, and I know, don't laugh, but we did have long, hot summers in Ireland. Uh, I think that's what I remember most of the time about my, my early childhood. But let me take you to one special summer. Uh, in the summer of 1970, I was six. Let me take you to a particular day in the summer of 1970 that I remember really well. It's one of my most vivid memories from back then, probably actually one of my earliest memories. So I'm, I'm standing in a field of lush green grass. I'm standing there in my short trousers and oversized Wellington boots. And the field I'm standing in is one of those fields quite close to the farmhouse. This is one of the fields where my dad kept the calves when they were very young. And it's a field I'd been in many, many times before. Sometimes on my own, this time I'm there with my dad. My dad had taken me there, and, and, and even as he had my hand walking towards the field, I got the sense that, you know, that something wasn't quite right. My dad used to whistle a lot when he walked the farm. This time there was no whistling. There was a sort of a dark expression on his face, but I didn't really understand why. As the two of us got further into the field, it became more apparent that something really was definitely not right. That, you know, the, the, the field was full of calves, for sure, but this time something is horribly wrong. And as we walked deeper and deeper into the field, all we could hear was nothing, nothing at all, nothing but silence. And something more unusual, there was no, there was no movement. Calves at that age are you know, normally frolicking about, chasing each other around the place. Instead, there was this deadly, motionless silence. Now, the field is full of calves, for sure, and they're all around me. The problem is many of them are dead and the rest of them are slowly dying. I'm surrounded by all of this death. I could smell it. In fact, I can still smell it today, this death hanging in the warm, clammy air. Now, some of the calves are very obviously dead. They're, they're, they're blown up carcasses, upended, lying rigid on the ground with their, with their legs sticking out, pointing out all sorts of different directions. Some are obviously in distress and are in pain. And most of them have flies, you know, crawling around their eyes and, and their nose. I could not believe it. I, I certainly couldn't understand it. It was a terrible scene, a very unfamiliar scene. And, and what seemed like even worse, it was happening in a place that was normally so familiar to me. This was all happening in a, in a place I called home. Now, it didn't seem like my home anymore. It, it didn't, it seemed like an alien place with, with something terrifying going on. And to a certain extent, there was a feeling of lost innocence about this whole experience. I'm feeling frightened. I'm feeling sad. I'm certainly feeling confused. It was a lot to take in for a little boy of six, filled with this horror and fear and distress. I'm not sure if I ever felt those emotions before. And I was very unsure about what they meant. For me, it looked and felt like what a catastrophe must feel like. For me, it felt like, you know, our whole world was, was caving in. I was thinking, what's happening here? Like, what's caused this? And, and who's to blame for this? And, and what had we done to deserve this? I guess I was too young, really, to comprehend 
everything that was going on. But I was old enough to recognize this was going to end badly. And I looked at my dad and I could only think it was going to end badly for all of us. But you know what? As I watched how my dad reacted to this catastrophe, I'll always remember what he said. He simply said, John, don't worry about this. You know, this sort of stuff happens. And it's not nice when it does happen, but it's going to be all right. We'll get some more cows. And at that moment, it dawned on me, you can work as hard as you like and be as prepared as you like and do all the right stuff and not leave anything to chance. But there are no guarantees. And you can never really be that certain about anything in life. And this is the first time I can remember realizing this, you know, that we can't predict everything. We can't be certain about everything. So in actual fact, we're much better off accepting that, you know, that this is the case and living with it, living with and accepting the uncertainty. Now, I, I could tell my dad was very upset at the calves dying, but he didn't seem to any of that blind fear that I had. You know, he, he actually seemed to take it in his stride. His attitude was, this certainly is not good, but it's happened now. We can't undo it. We just need to figure out what to do next. We work out a plan. Now, you know, it might be tough for a while, but we'll get through this. And you know what? He actually seemed to personify the acceptance of how uncertain life can be. Of course, it was only many, many years later that I realized my, my dad had brought me into that field on purpose. I, I guess so that I could experience this gritty situation for myself. Uh, I don't believe it was you know, orchestrated in any way, but he clearly thought I should be part of it. I guess he believed some good would come of it. And he was absolutely right. You know, what I got out of it was to realize not only that bad stuff happens, but more importantly, life is a series of uncertainties. And we really need to learn to live with those uncertainties. So way back at the age of, of six, the tender age of six, I had this realization that apparently bad stuff can happen and that life was uncertain. And no matter what you did to try to make it otherwise, it was still gonna be uncertain. I guess in hindsight, I would probably see this more, of a, more as a, a liberation because that allowed me not to take the bad stuff personally. And that in turn freed me up to put most of my energy into dealing with the uncertainty when it happened and not try to prevent it from happening or hoping it wouldn't happen or, or then getting mad when it did happen. The lesson here from when I was six is why I'm convinced I learned more useful business stuff as a six-year-old than, than I did at any point since. And that is because life is full of uncertainty. And business life is even more crammed packed with uncertainty. And an entrepreneurial business life is almost defined by uncertainty. In an entrepreneurial world, we are busy crashing through walls and uprooting trees and, and, and being disruptive. You know, we're, we're constantly challenging the norm and, and, and doing things differently. When you think about it though, we're, we, you know, we're putting ourselves in the way of challenge, of setbacks, of adversity all the time. And it stands to reason that we'll be surrounded by uncertainty, you know, possibly even more so than in other, other walks of life. A few years ago, I used to speak about the business uncertainty surrounding Brexit, you know, both from a British and a European perspective. And only just 12 months ago, it felt like the most uncertain, all-encompassing risk we faced as an industry or as a community or even as a nation was Brexit. Now, clearly, lots of opportunity, but also risk and definitely lots of uncertainty. But of course, all of this was thrown abruptly to one side by the COVID pandemic. COVID, of course, didn't build up over time. It was incredibly sudden. It wasn't confined to the UK or to Europe. It was global. And it wasn't an industry-specific problem. It affected all industries alike. And COVID implied death. So it was very emotional. And it led to a lot of panic. And, of course, it's not over. Now, in the UK, we've got one of the best vaccination rollout programs there is. And, and, and Boris, of course, has announced the four-step roadmap to get us out of lockdown. But COVID is still with us. Now, I reckon if Brexit was defined by uncertainty, it certainly seems as if COVID has been uncertainty to the power of 10. 
But just like any other form of uncertainty, we need to find a way to live with it. We need to find a way to manage it, and we need to find a way to deal with it. In 1987, 17 years after all those calms dying, we set up New Common Garden Soup Company. Of course, right at the beginning, we were told it couldn't be done. All the experts told, it could, told us it couldn't be done. Not only could it not be done, but if we dared to try, we'd end up killing somebody. That's right. The science experts told us, you will kill someone. Liquid soup needs to be sterilized. That's why it's, it's in a can. You have to put liquid soup in a can. Other experts told us, you know, even if we did try to do it, consumers would never find it in the supermarket anyway. And, you know, supermarket is there. And, and if people want to buy soup, they'll go down the soup aisle. You know, they'll never expect to find soup in the chiller. And yet more experts told us, soup doesn't belong in a carton. Yeah, you know, that's all wrong. Milk goes in a carton. That's what the experts told us. Huh? Did we listen? Of course we didn't. We knew better, even though, to be honest, we, we didn't read it. In summer 1987, I met a guy called Andrew Palmer. And it was Andrew's brainchild, if you like, to bring fresh soup to the market. So we decided to do it together. We didn't really know what we were in for, but we set about proving our idea the only way we knew how, and that was by doing it. To be fair, back in 1987, all liquid soup was in a can. And that's the way it's been for over 100 years, frankly. You know, your parents bought soup in a can, their parents bought soup in a can. And to be honest, their parents before them bought soup in a can. That's the convention of the time. That was the conventional wisdom. But we didn't want it in a can. We wanted it in something that made it fresh. We didn't want it in a can because, you know, putting it in a can, you need to cook the living daylights out of it. You, so you can sterilize it and, and, and make sure it lasts to up to, you know, 12 or 18 months. Now this, of course, kills nutrition and also completely changes the, the flavor. We didn't want the product to taste of the process you used to give it a really long shelf life. We wanted the product to, you know, funnily enough, taste of the fresh ingredients we used to make it in the first place. We wanted to have a fresh soup process. So the theory was great, but we needed a practical solution. We thought, you know, how difficult is it going to be? You know, lots of people already put milk in cartons. Shouldn't be too tricky putting soup in cartons. How wrong we were. We spent 18 months trying to get soup into cartons like this. I kid you not. Now, we chose the carton because it screamed freshness. And ultimately, the carton became our biggest asset. But it was also our biggest challenge, especially in the early days. Carton fitting machines were designed to fill milk and juice. And these products are completely liquid. There aren't any bits in them. And soup, as you know, a lot of time has bits in it and often quite large bits. And consumers really like bits. In fact, the more bits and the bigger the bits, the better. Think about it for a minute. Yeah, imagine what a soup factory might look like, yeah? There's basically three main stages. There's, there's cooking and there's filling and then there's cooling. So we cook the soup in, in large vessels, right? And then we pump the soup into the carton filler. It was filled hot. So then we needed to cool it down. We needed to go to the chilling station. Our challenge was very simply to redesign the bit in the middle, the carton filler. Easier said than done, as it turned out. The carton filler was originally designed to fill cold milk. And we needed to come up with something to fill hot liquids with big bits floating around it. Something which was never done before. And this turned out to be a major challenge. Think of it like this. So you've got a bucket full of water, right? Which has four marbles at the bottom of it. You want to pour the water in your bucket into four separate egg cups so that each egg cup is full of water, but also each egg has one marble each. When the water's boiling hot and you don't want to spill any, and you need to do it as quickly as possible, right? To move on to the next one. Bit of a ludicrous idea, right? I mean, were we mad? And you know, I'm not sure what really possessed us to think this was a good thing to try and, and to ever make work, but we tried. And believe me, there were many, many days when we had soup on the ceiling and soup on the walls and soup on the floor and no soup in the bloody carton. 
And I have to say, you know, although those early days were quite fun, there were many, many moments which, which it really looked like, you know, wasn't going to work. It felt at times like some of the problems had become insurmountable. But we kept on going. We worked day and night trying to get those bloody pieces of vegetable and chicken floating around in hot liquid into our cartons. We figured out, you know, that the entire process was almost impossible to get right. Almost. Literally after 18 months of trial and error under our belt with lots and lots of dead ends, many of them incredibly frustrating, we eventually ended up with a process which we found was going to work. We added in some IP along the way and we even patented the process because it was what was called at the time a novel process. And, you know, during all this time, I remember thinking, we need to find an experienced technologist or an experienced industrialist who can, who can show us how to do all this. Or better still, just do it for us. So, you know, having searched high and low for this person, right at the end of this 18 months, we eventually found him. Can you imagine who it might have been? Exactly. He was with us all along. It, it was me. In effect, you know, the closest thing to an expert that existed in this field anywhere was me. No one knew more about what we were trying to achieve by definition than I did. And anyway, we didn't really need an expert. After all, all those experts, you know, told us it couldn't be done. Remember the scientists who told us you'd kill somebody, liquid soup needs to be sterilized, that's why it's in a can. Now, of course, we absolutely need to make sure the process was going to be safe and not going to kill anybody. But we, you know, we definitely made sure we sorted that out. But wasn't it interesting that the starting point for so many experts, if you like, was your crazy idea will not work. Putting liquid soup in something other than a can will be a disaster. And actually, in hindsight, I'd go as far to say that if there's just one thing we did to make New Common Garden Soup Company successful, and that was putting soup in a carton. And I remember those other experts do, you know, told us the consumers wouldn't find it on the shelf anyway. They, they, they'll go down the soup aisle if they want soup. They won't expect to find soup in the chiller. Well, as it turned out, consumers love the idea of finding soup in the chiller. Being in the chiller meant it was fresh and it reminded them because it tasted of the fresh ingredients, you know, used to make it. And the other experts, he said, you know, soup doesn't belong in a carton. It's all wrong. Milk goes in a carton. Well, consumers love the carton too. So much so that in the early 90s, consumer believed that fresh soup only came in a carton. And by the way, when the big retailers launched their own version of fresh soup a few years later, and ultimately all of them did, the last thing they wanted to put their fresh soup in was a carton, because that was New Carbon Garden Soup Company territory. The carton, in effect, had become synonymous with the New Carbon Garden brand. Remember, the carton spoke freshness, and the consumer identified with this. So the retailers and other brands later, they had to find a way around this. So they put their soup into other things like plastic tubs and, and pouches. And that is how it has remained to this very day. So the carton became our greatest asset. And I think when you think about it really, you know, that's the difference between an expert and an entrepreneur. An expert tells you, sorry, mate, that won't work. And here's 20 reasons why it won't work. And an entrepreneur tells you, let me show you how it will work. In effect, of course, these so-called expert views, they represented the, the, the conventional wisdom of the day. And in my experience, this is much more about convention and a lot less about wisdom. Of course, it can be a brave or, or a foolish decision to decide, you know, I'm going to do this myself and nobody ever has done it before. You know, all the experts are telling you you're crazy. You're telling yourself you're crazy at times. You know, your ankle soup, ankle soup, your ankle deep in soup one day and absolutely nothing is working the next. And all the while, the little money that you've raised to get things started is running out. But it's moments like these when you need to have the courage of your convictions. Your conviction, in my view, is about not listening to the conventional wisdom and doing it a different way. And your courage is to trust yourself to get on with doing the difficult stuff yourself. Now, don't get me wrong, my message is not about debunking experts. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be Michael Gove here and, and, and suggest we don't need experts. We, we often do need experts. Expertise can, in the right situation, be a huge asset. On the contrary, my, my message is 
in business, it's not about finding an expert to do the stuff that hasn't been done before. Because really, an expert is an expert in stuff that has already been done before. That's how it got to be an expert. But I think back about it, you know, I learned a lot at Newcomb Garden Soup Company about fitting soup into cartons, certainly, and, and about how to make things happen in the food industry, for sure. And about business, of course. But I also learned it was, you know, definitely an even more important lesson when I realized it's down to you and down to you alone to have the courage of your convictions. So there's two stories, right? You know, and you might ask, you know, why am I talking about things like my dad's calves or my dad's calves dying in a field, you know, when I was six? And, you know, this is, this is highlighting to me that the setbacks can happen, but only because life is full of uncertainty. You know, we need to not fight this fact, but instead keep it and, and accept it and, and focus on dealing with the outcome of the uncertainty. And what about the struggle we had getting soup into cartons? Well, that's clearly about having the courage of your convictions, you know, the conviction that you are right, despite people queuing up the block or around the block to tell you you're wrong. And the courage to do the difficult stuff yourself, this stuff that's never been done before. But precisely because it's never been done before, that means that the outcome of what you are trying to do is uncertain. So we're back to uncertainty again. But you might think, you know, there's nothing new about that. Yeah. Entrepreneurs have to be comfortable with uncertainty. They need to manage the risk that uncertainty brings. But when we think about it, an entrepreneur, I think, really needs to do more than that. To my mind, an entrepreneur needs to not only live with uncertainty, uncertainty but also needs to, to turn that uncertainty into a competitive advantage. Now, this at first might seem a bit of a, you know, a, might seem counterintuitive, but, it, but it's not. Entrepreneurs know this, and the successful ones practice it. Within every uncertainty lies opportunity. And the really successful businesses are those who understand the benefit of not only you know, deriving an advantage from uncertainty, but working on delivering a competitive advantage. Remember the old joke about uh, the lions in the Serengeti, one of Billy Connolly's favorites? Let, let me remind you, a pair of journalists are filling lions on the, on the Serengeti plane, yeah? And, and they're far enough away from the lions not to bother them, right? But over time, gradually the wind changes and the lions pick up their scent. And as the lions gradually meander in the direction of the cameramen, they begin to, to pick up pace and, 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 and get into a job. And one cameraman slips, slips off his shoes and, and pulls on a pair of Nikes. And the other cameraman, you know, looks at him and says, you don't think you're going to outrun a lion in those, do you? Which the guy with the Nike says, you know, I'm not that concerned about the lion, to be honest. All I know is I'm going to outrun you. And, you know, it's a bit of a joke, but the point here to hear is you don't need to be perfect. You don't need to be perfect. You just need to be better than your competition. You don't need to outrun a lion. You just need to outrun your competition. You need to be better than your competition. The guys who haven't figured out yet what the, you know, the shift in their consumer behavior has been or is likely to be. And they're still trying to, you know, make an outdated business model work, a business model or a, a strategy in this case, which you know, has been more suited to pre-COVID times perhaps. You are focusing on the future and what will make a difference, perhaps make a huge difference. In any event, smart business leaders recognize the opportunity in uncertainty. And if it really is the case that we've never lived through more uncertainty than we have today, then even smarter business leaders now, there's never been more opportunity than there is today. You just need to look in the right place. You need to turn your uncertainty into your competitive advantage. Thank you.